Are you tired of manually plugging and unplugging USB devices? Maybe, for some reason, the idea of touching hardware makes you uneasy. Perhaps you want to programmatically control the connection of hot pluggable devices. Well, you've clicked on the right video. With just a few tools, you can build your own barely working, completely unreliable but programmable USB mount thing. This is a USB drive. You've seen this pop up on the channel before, most notably on the first video ever, where I used it to show why properly ejecting a USB drive is necessary. At the time, I said that manually unplugging the drive while writes are happening is a harsh but fair test for verifying that software does I.O. safely. I still stand by that statement, but I will also admit that it is hard to write unit tests that require someone to manually plug and unplug a USB drive at random intervals. Bundling humans in continuous integration pipelines is not standard yet, although I'm sure someone in Silicon Valley is working on it. I'll stick to using machines to do work, if that's okay with you. So, after many sleepless nights and a lot of trial and error, I managed to solve this problem, a problem which only I have once and for all. Did it need to be solved? I'm not sure, but it makes for a fun story, and I learned a thing or two. The idea is that instead of unplugging the USB drive, I'll cut the connection to the wire, specifically this wire. This is a USB 2.0 patch cable. It is a bundle of four wires, plus shielding. Two of the wires, the red and black, are used for power, and the other two, white and green, are used for data. It is enough to sever the data wires on the device to stop from being connected to the host PC. Let me show you. I will connect the USB drive on one end and the other end to the PC. Then I'll connect these four wires on the breadboard. The USB drive appears on the PC, but if I disconnect the data lines, it's as if the drive is unplugged. Plugging them back again connects the drive as usual. Excellent! We only need to manage two wires, but it's still manual, so we didn't make much progress. What we need is a way to control this mechanical connection from a process, sending some sort of signal. I'm sure there are many ways to control an electrical connection with a logical signal, but the one I find the easiest to understand is a relay. This is a relay. It is an electrically operated switch. You put power between these two terminals and the connection is made between these two terminals. Remove the power and the connection is severed. The connection is not some weird solid state thing. It is an actual electrical connection with metal strips touching and everything. It is literally a control break in the wire, electrically exactly equivalent to cutting and reconnecting the wire at will. As I said, simple and understandable. I'll add two of these to the breadboard, one for each USB data line. Let's also make the connection between each end of the USB data lines. The shielding and the power will remain permanently connected. All we need now is to apply power to these two relays and the USB cable will be connected fully. Applying power means finding some way to get an electrical signal from the PC to the terminals of the relay. This signal must be controllable from software and be able to supply enough power to operate the relay. These relays consume 360 milliwatts each, which at 5 volts means they require 72 milliamps or 144 milliamps for both. This, dear viewer, is not only one, but two problems. The first problem is that I don't have any computer around me with a programmable output at this power level. The closest I have is USB, which can deliver 500 milliamps at 5 volts, enough to power both relays. However, that is on the USB power lines, which I cannot control programmatically. What I can control is the USB data lines, but these offer only up to 3.3 volts when set to a logical high, but at not enough current to power the relay. The second problem is that even if the current was high enough, USB is not programmable as a low high signal. That's just not how USB works. USB is a full bus with a protocol and specs and 
everything. You can just set the line high and keep it there. That's what a parallel or a serial port would do, but these are rare nowadays and I certainly don't have any on my PC. What we need is something that we can programmatically ask to turn a pin low or high and that has enough power to operate the relays. To do that, we need what's called a general purpose input output device or GPIO just like the one I have here. This is built around the FT232H chip and it has these 10 pins that can be set to low or high programmatically from a process running on the PC that it is connected to via this USB port here. Here's how we can use this. With the 232 connected via USB, I will measure the voltage between the C0 pin and ground. You can see this is at 0 volt, which is by convention logical low. Now, I will execute these few lines of Python code that let me set the C0 pin to logical high. When I set the pin value to true, the voltage becomes 3.3 volts, which is the logical high. Setting it to false again puts it at 0 volts. It looks like we have solved the control problem, but these pins can supply only up to 100 milliamps each, which doesn't help with power delivery. To deal with that, we'll need a transistor. This is a transistor, specifically a BC548C NPN bipolar junction transistor. Can you even see what it says there? I can barely read it to be honest. What I can say though is that it works like a valve for electricity and it is controlled via these three legs, which are called the collector, the base and the emitter. If we send a current through the base, the collector opens up and lets a much greater current pass through it and the emitter. As a side note, I find it ironic that as a programmer I can exercise absolute control over billions of transistors with a few lines of code but when I'm faced with just one of them, I'm at a loss. It took me the better part of a week to figure out how to use one of these things. In fact, I have in the description some videos that help me a lot figure out most of this stuff out. If you want proper explanations about what I'm doing here, take a look at that stuff. You won't regret it. Anyway, with this thing, we intake a low power logical signal from one of our GPIO pins and amplify it so that it can operate the relay. And that solves our second problem. Let's put this on the breadboard too. We'll need a register between the control pin and the base, so we can limit the current through the transistor so it doesn't burn up and let the magic smoke out. It's a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor and in the description I have the calculations needed to get that value. Then we need to connect the power pins of the relays to 5 volts the ground pins to the collector and the emitter to ground, so the circuit is complete. The last piece is the 5 volt power supply to the relays. For that, I use a breadboard power supply that takes wall power and outputs 5 volts. I also need to connect common ground between the GPIO board and this power supply. The finishing touch is to connect the USB drive to the PC and of course, turn it on. Here it is in action. I'm going to run the same code as before, but this time the C0 pin will be driving the transistor. With everything connected, setting the pin high should close the relays and the USB drive should show up. Here we go. I'm just as surprised as you are. Does it get disconnected? How about that? I think it's working well enough, but there is still one question left to answer. What is this useful for? As I said at the start, this lets us control the physical connection of a USB drive from a process. Without this, if we want to test how a program handles crashes, we have to emulate them through some mock layer, either in user space or in a kernel module. In any case though, we are still at the mercy of various software and hardware buffers that may hide problems with the code that we can observe only if the actual physical connection is interrupted, like it may happen during a power outage or a serious hardware failure. If you want to do this kind of hardcore testing, then a device like the one we built can go a long way. 
In part 2, we'll write some Rust code that does this kind of testing. Until then, take care and thank you for watching.